And I just want to encourage you, listen, it is in the nature of our God to do supernatural things. And maybe just today is about getting some courage back to believe it again. In fact, I feel like the Holy Spirit is leaning in right now and say, some of you need to speak to that again. Like to say the thing, God, I'm believing you're going to do X. Whatever that is, you've stopped talking about it because you don't want to get disappointed again. I feel like God's just saying, hey, no, start speaking those things that are not as though they are. There is something to speaking and believing in faith that God's going to turn things around. I, I do. I'm, I'm stoked to, to talk about this, and I want to just challenge and encourage you. Um, two things. One, I want to challenge, and, and I hope to, to give a little courage back to you, and the other is I want to just challenge you to be faithful in prayer. We, we pick up this story with, in Daniel 3 with Nebuchadnezzar where he makes a nine-story tall homage to himself. He builds a statue of himself, nine stories tall, 10 feet wide, but he doesn't just stop there. He kicks it up a whole nother level, and he says, hey, I, we're going to play music. It would be kind of like a call to prayer in some Middle Eastern countries. We're going to play some music, and when the music is played, stop what you're doing. So if you're in the middle of work, put your tools down, stop doing everything. If you're driving, pull over to the side of the road. Stop everything you're doing when you hear the music played and you bow down. You bow down and you worship the idol of myself. And if you don't bow down, then you are going to burn. And that's just really encouraging, isn't it? And what I love about the story is that three of our heroes, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they heard the news, they understand what the king had said, and they refused to bow. They chose, we will not bow. And I want to challenge and encourage you, never bow to compromise in your life. You're going to have opportunities on a daily basis. Every day, you're going to have an opportunity to compromise. And usually, it will not be blatant like this, where the world is watching, and you will have to physically bow. Usually, the compromise will happen in your mind first, followed by your heart, and then your actions. So there's an edict that goes out. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow, and there's some other punks in the, in the world at that time that saw them, and they went and ratted them out to the king. The scripture says, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Well, the king gets a little upset, as you might imagine. He's got to do something about it. And obviously, he's got an ego issue. He built a nine-story tall statue of himself. So he summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he recounts to them what he's heard from these other leaders, and he talks to them. He says, now, when you're ready and you hear the sound of the horn and the pipe and the lyre and the, all the other instruments and every kind of music, fall down and worship the image that I have made, and everything will be well and good. But if you do not worship... You shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And then who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? You probably won't have someone spite or chite your God in your life, but they're doing it through culture on a daily basis. And I love the response of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand. They had confidence in the power of God. I think we believe in God, but often we struggle to have, have confidence and faith in the power of God. Trust in God implies the recognition of his power and his omnipotence. It's, it's one thing to, to, to think that God has power. It's another to believe that he can do something that is completely contrary to nature. And some of you might be facing scenarios that are overwhelming and seem impossible, but our God is a miracle-working God. We still believe in the power of healing. We still believe in the miraculous. We still believe in the prophetic. And we believe that God does supernatural things in natural circumstances. And I just want to challenge you with that. That's what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. They had a faith in the midst of what was overwhelming that God's power would be on display. And they didn't stop there. They were fully submitted to God's will, whatever the cost. You probably won't face a life-threatening scenario based upon your faith. There's a really good chance you won't. These guys were. 
But they didn't just believe in his power. They were submitted to him regardless of the cost. Listen to what they said. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand. And they continue on. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they said, it doesn't matter what happens to us. It doesn't matter if we die in the furnace, we will not bow to compromise. We believe that God can and will save us, but if we die, we die. Paul said something similar. He said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, when we're a follower of Jesus, we're promised eternity. This life is no longer about this life, and we have a hope in a future of an eternity with him. So they said, we're not just submitted to God if he does what I want. I'm submitted to God regardless of the cost. It tells me that they did not consider their death as a failure of faith, but rather as an indication of God's will. I think sometimes we get into the mood of praying for things, and we limit God and put him into the box of answering exactly like I want him to answer it. And God's like, listen, I'm not here to give you what you want. I'm here to give you what you need. I'm here to take care of your needs. The the scripture says that my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Some of you need to just change your prayer requests. Some of you might just need to say, God, I'm here for whatever you want for me. Also, that's a scary prayer too. (laughs) I think sometimes we don't want to pray that one as well. Because if he calls on me, then I might just have to be obedient. And that's also scary. That's not in my message. Let's move on. Their faith was not in their deliverance, but their faith was in God. Nebuchadnezzar was ticked off. He turns to the guards. He says, heat the furnace hotter than it's ever been before. And they bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the guards begin to take them to the furnace, which would have been about the size of a, maybe a bedroom, if you will. And there would have been a place at the top where they could have put the men into it. And And the Bible says it got so hot that it burnt the guards to death before they could even push Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in. Now, let's just pause for a minute. If you've been around church for a minute, or you've probably heard the story, even if you haven't, you watched Veggie Tales, there's all kinds of things that have helped you understand this. You, 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 your grandfather, your great, 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 great grandfather, and people for thousands of years have only heard this story with the end in mind. If you're Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't know the end of the story yet. This is a scary scenario. Now, you, you hear it and you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is so cool. They're about to be in a fire and they're gonna live through it. They're going, oh my gosh, it's been a good run, Lord, we love you. <laughs> this is terrifying, right? He's like, they watch the guards die before they're thrown in. This is not good. Can you put yourself there? Some of you don't have to because you're facing something that is overwhelming. You're facing scenarios that are overwhelming. And I just want to encourage you, put a little courage back in. Just like the song we sang today, God is always on time. He's a miracle working God. He's doing things exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or imagine. You say, Pastor Kerry, you see that verse every week? Yeah, I do. Because you need to be reminded of it. And you know who else does? Me. Exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or imagine. I've got a great imagination. Yeah, and he supersedes that. They're thrust into the fire, and then the miraculous takes place. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered and he said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like the son of God. Now, we don't know for certain, but the Bible would refer to this as what's called a Christophany. This is before the coming of Jesus, before Christmas, okay? This is is before the coming of Jesus, and we don't know for certain, but we could probably safely assume that in the midst of the fire, Jesus shows up and is walking with them. There's a promise of this echoed in one of the prophets called Isaiah, where it says, fear not, for when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. And when you walk in the water, you will not drown. Now, this is not a scripture telling you that you should go try to walk through a fire literally and put God to the test. That would be foolishness. We would call you a silly goose. 
In the South, they say, bless your heart. If you meet someone from the South and they say, bless your heart, they don't actually mean bless your heart. <laughs> they mean you're a silly goose. <laughs> but the prophet Isaiah, his words still ring true that no matter what it is that we're walking through, it is not going to take us out. And if we lose our life, like Paul said, to live as Christ, to die is gain because now I'm standing in eternity with the Father. That's why when we lose people who are close to us that pass away that know Jesus, we grieve on this side of eternity because we miss the relationship, but we celebrate where they're at. When my dad passed, I grieved the loss. I grieved not getting text messages from him on Sunday, but the cancer was so bad that I celebrated the gain of him standing on the other side of eternity saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is to, and is to come. Are you with me? So we see their faith emerge, and we see God show up just like he does time and time again. We saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow to compromise. And with Daniel, we see a story, and we remember that we bow only before our God. Isn't it interesting there's two stories? One is about not bowing, and the other one is about bowing. It's God reminding us who we bow before. The king declares no one is to pray or worship anyone but him. It's a new king, same kingdom. No one can worship anyone but me as the king. And if you do, you die. And what I love is look at Daniel's response. Daniel 6 verse 10 says this. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, it doesn't say he didn't know. It says when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem and he got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed. When he knew the document had been signed. In other words, in the midst of facing adversity, he decided I will choose to bow only before my king of kings and the Lord of lords. He went back to his house and he'd done what he had always done every day to kneel three times a day and to pray. He was following the great theologian M.C. Hammer. You gotta pray just to make it today. First service laughed a lot harder than y'all did. Must be a young crowd. M.C. Hammer is an artist that, okay, we'll move on. <laughs> it was Daniel's custom to pray. He always prayed every day and he always opened his windows towards Jerusalem. Now, this is not a primary point in the scripture, but it begs the question of why. And we don't have the answers we can only assume. And one reason could be that he opened the windows towards Jerusalem to focus his mind, to get his mind, his will, and his emotions focused on what he's praying, which you, you and I can relate to that. If you've ever started to pray and nobody is around you, it's easy. If you're like me, ADHD, within 0.7 seconds, I'm thinking about lunch or I'm thinking about the Cowboys or whatever it is. So maybe Daniel was focusing his attention, but I think what was probably more likely is that he was looking in the direction of Jerusalem as a reminder of God's covenant, that Daniel was a part of God's family, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood selected by God chosen with a promise, the same God who gave them a promise that in the future a Messiah would come and set, get, take away the sins of the world and bring freedom in a way that they could never experience outside of Jesus. So I think it's more likely that when Daniel looked towards Jerusalem, he was reminding himself of the promises of God because you need to be reminded of the promises when you're not walking in the fulfillment of them. When everything is working great, you don't need to be reminded of the promises. You're like, yeah, this is pretty awesome. I don't know what that was. But you, when you're facing challenges, when you're up against a rock in a hard place, or when the world is saying, if you don't do this, you are in trouble, then we need to be reminding ourselves that God is faithful, God is true, that he's never left us nor forsaken us, that we've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. We gotta remind ourselves of the promises. When you are up against it and you're going, I don't don't think our marriage can make it. You remind yourself of the promises of God that there can be restoration and you believe for that. When you're facing a diagnosis or a prognosis or you have a health issue, you remind yourself that God is our healer. Even if you're not walking in healing, I'm declaring healing. This past year, my pastor, David Wright, found out that he has rigid Parkinson's. It's a crazy diagnosis and it won't kill him, but it will change his life 
over the course of the next few years, and he'll slowly lose mobility. And I met with him a few weeks ago, and I said, okay, I'm praying for healing. How you doing? He goes, you know what? My body hasn't caught up with my healing yet, but it's on the way. And I was like, I like that. (laughs) I like that. Like, he said, no, no, no. I don't care what my body's telling me. I know what the word of God says. And you say, well, what if God doesn't heal him? Well, listen, to live is Christ, to die is gain. No matter what, he wins. Are you tracking with me? And I'm not a name it and claim it type preacher. That's not what I'm here to try to tell you to do. But some of you need to get a little faith back and start speaking to things that are not as though they are. Like to just begin to say, no, I'm believing that this is going to be great. I'm believing that God is up to something beautiful. I'm believing that God is going to move in a way that he's never moved before. Some of you need to change the music you're listening to. Some of you need to get some worship on and sing some big faith songs. Like he's a miracle working God. Like he's going to move mountains. Like I'm believing God is up to something so miraculous that in years to come, I'm going to tell the story of his faithfulness and people will not believe it. Like, some, like literally, I mean it, some of you need to say it out loud. Some of you are afraid to say it out loud because you spoke it before, didn't come to pass, and you don't want to be discouraged again. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit, at first service, I felt the same thing. The Holy Spirit said, hey, no, start speaking to that mountain. Start speaking to it. Well, what if it doesn't happen like I want it to? It doesn't matter. You're going to build your faith, and God's got a plan for you. Romans 8, 28 says, we know in all things. Everyone say, all things. Say, All things. Say it with some faith. Say all things. We know in all things God is working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if I don't get what I want, it doesn't matter because God's got something better. Are you with me? That's the kind of faith you want. And if you don't have that kind of faith, let's hang out. I'll give you some faith. Sometimes it's easier to have faith for other people than for yourself. That's why you need the church to rub up on shoulders and be like, hey, I'm struggling. I'm not feeling awesome. And they can slap you and say, come on, God is bigger. Are you tracking with me? Daniel gets on his knees after he hears of the declaration and he turns towards Jerusalem and he just says, I will remember and rehearse the covenant and the promises of God because if God spoke it, it is truth. The word says God is not a man that he can lie. He, he, whatever he speaks becomes truth. I'm rehearsing and I'm reminding myself of the promises of God. What I love about Daniel is that his prayer life was marked by discipline and consistency. Discipline and consistency. Verse 10 says, he got down on his knees three times a day and he prayed. Discipline and consistency. Discipline and consistency. Every day he prayed. Every day he prayed. Every day he prayed. I am on this kick right now that as followers of Jesus, we have to become people of prayer. And listen, spontaneous prayer in the, in the midst of crisis is good, but it is not consistent, disciplined, regular prayer. At some point, look at me in the eyes, grow up. You need to develop a prayer life. Well, I don't know how to pray. Well, I'll help you teach you to pray. Come to team night tonight. We'll talk about it. But you know how to talk. You know how to pray. Yeah. Do you know how I pray? The Lord on high. How I don't do I, God. <laughs> Today, I need you more than ever. I, God, I don't, I don't have what it takes to pastor this church, but you do, God. Would you just help me walk in your spirit? Father, I want to hear your words for my life, not my... God, my thoughts are so crazy sometimes. I get so insecure, and I get so trapped here. God, would you renew within me a steadfast spirit, oh God? And when I don't believe it, Father, would you help me to believe? That's how I pray. If you know how to worry, you know how to pray. If you know how to freak out, you know how to pray. Sometimes I yell at God. I'm a Christian and I cuss a little bit. And sometimes I do in my prayers. Be free. (laughs) Be free. Uh, How I talk is how I talk to God. He hears it. He knows how I think is how I talk to God. Daniel went back and he prayed. So listen. Spontaneity, like, oh, I got to pray. Oh, I to, things went crazy. I got to pray. No, you, you need to develop something disciplined. I invited Brooks up here, and, and he's playing something pretty. What are you playing right now? Come rest on us. Come, Holy Spirit. Y'all hear that right there? He plays something pretty. The, the Spirit of God shows up, and it's a reminder hey, wrap it up, Pastor Kerry. Now, just do, have some fl- fun and do a little fluff in there. Isn't that pretty? Now, he didn't know I was going to do this until first service. Now, just play some cool play. (laughs) 
You like that? Now, play some Journey for me. Ooh, you feel that spontaneity, that little change up? Best Journey song of all time, I don't care what you say. I'm forever yours, faithfully. Okay, now play something Christian again. <laughs> you know, how cool is that? Like, wouldn't you love to do that? If you can do that and you're not on this team, you're robbing God of your gifts and talents, but we'll talk about that another day. Just spontaneously goes from pretty to like beautiful to Coldplay to Journey. I mean, come on. That is not something that accidentally just happened. This guy has spent days, weeks, months, and years practicing. The amount of time that he plays on a Sunday morning pales in comparison to the dedication and the consistency and the practice and the discipline that shows up and I can just say, play some Coldplay, and he's like, he hears it in his mind and he goes to it. The same happens with your prayer life. When you pray daily and consistently, you are not thwarted or taken aback by crisis. It doesn't rock your faith because you just know I've got muscle memory that now goes to a path of prayer. And what I did yesterday, I'm going to do today. I didn't see the mountain yesterday, but God did. He's the same God who can move it. So though there's a mountain in front of me, I'm going to respond with prayer. Are you with me? So you have got, you and I have to grow up. At some point, we have got to develop a prayer life on a daily basis so that when the stuff hits the fan, I am not shocked and rocked by it. Are you with me? God can handle your crisis prayers. He, like a father, loves it anytime we talk to him. So I'm not saying don't pray during crisis. I'm just saying pray every day. Pray every day. Pray every day. Because Daniel was disciplined in prayer, it meant that his spiritual focus was not destroyed by sudden crisis. But he didn't just pray. He also gave thanks. He got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed and he gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Can you imagine a relationship where all one party ever did was ask for things? They're called children. <laughs> it's okay to go to God and ask him for things, but some of you need to develop the ability of just being thankful. Gratitude shifts perspective. Scientifically, the same part of your brain that is used for anxiety is also used for gratitude. They cannot coexist. And, and some of you just need to start by being grateful. If you're at a job that you hate, thank God that you have a job and you're not unemployed. If you are a boss and you have employees that you don't like, thank God you've got a business that's at least functioning to a certain extent. If you're having money problems, start thanking God for what you do have and make sure you're generous. Yeah. And listen, by the way, if you are surviving in Orange County, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> like, you're doing pretty good. Are you tracking with me? And if all things go horrible, go to the beach and thank God for the ocean. Amen? <laughs> Breathe in the salty air and hear the sound of the waves. We pay for it anyways. That's why gas costs $8 billion a gallon. And when you're filling up your, gas, your fuel tank and, and it's, you see $6.18, thank God for the car that you have. That it works. And if it doesn't work all the time, thank God it works today. And if it's broken down today, thank God you have someone you can call. Don't call me, but call Pastor Joe. He'll come pick you up. <laughs> and he could probably help fix it. I, I do not know. But you know... If you don't have anything to be thankful, just thank God you have the greatest pastor on the planet. Can I get an amen? Like if you, you have some things to be thankful for, and the moment you start thanking God for those things, your perspective shifts, and you know what follows your shift in your perspective? You start asking God for different things. You start realizing, oh, I don't know if I actually needed that like I thought I needed it. Now, God, what do you want from me? Because you've done a pretty good job. Like, it's this, now that I think about it, things are awesome. And you were like whining, complaining 30 minutes ago. Are you with me? So Daniel, he didn't just sit down and make a supplication or just say, God, save me. He said, God, thank you. 
You are faithful and true. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You never leave us nor forsake us. Never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you that you're always on time. Every single day, every minute, every hour. There's never been a moment in my life where you weren't in it. You're always on time. Same kind of punks saw Daniel praying. It was actually a trap that they laid on purpose because they were jealous of him. And they ran to the king. And they said, king, he's praying. You got to throw him in the lion's den. You signed the law. You can't change that. So Daniel's thrown into the lion's den. They roll a stone in front of the mouth, and all hope is lost, but we know the end of the story, don't we? The king was so distraught, he fasted and prayed the whole night. Verse 19 says, Then at at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. And as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, Oh, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to to deliver you from the lions. O king, live forever, Daniel said. My God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him and also before you, O king, and they have done me no harm. Just as God did before and does time and time and again, he delivered Daniel. I don't know what you're facing today. If it's just moments of courage that you need because you're facing the opportunity to bow before compromise or if it's moments of faith to bow before the Lord and believe that he's gonna move on your behalf, I just wanna challenge you to get some courage back, to build your faith. And by the way, you can build your faith by choosing. It doesn't mean by tenure at a church and it's not like this. You just choose. Okay, I'm gonna choose faith. And sometimes faith doesn't follow your feelings. But your feelings will follow your focus. So get a little faith back. Amen? I want to give some people an opportunity right now to begin the journey with Jesus, to say yes to him. There's a starting point. And some of you have never prayed a prayer or begun the journey. Look at me. Some of you have been running from God, and today's the day to come running back. In a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer and just make this prayer your own. It's going to be a holy moment, the beginning, listen, of a brand new season and a brand new chapter. The Bible says the old has passed away, and behold, I'm a new creature, a new creation. So if you're here and you've never begun the journey, it's time to begin it again for the first time in a long time. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If that's you, just make this prayer your own. Just say, dear God, I know that you love me, that you've given me purpose, but I'm not perfect. Would you forgive me? And now just make this statement your own. Just say, Jesus, I give you my life. In Jesus' name. Head still bowed, eyes still closed, nobody moving, nobody looking around. If you're here and you prayed that prayer with me, would you do me a favor? In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And just right where you're standing, when I get to three, if you prayed that prayer, just put your hand up and put it right back down. You're saying, Pastor Kerry, I prayed that prayer. I'm beginning that journey. If that's you, on the count of three, lift your hands. Ready? One, two, three. Put your hands up. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Awesome, awesome, awesome. God, we just thank you and give you honor and glory for what you've begun in this place. God, we thank you that you're helping us stir up our faith and our courage so that no matter what we face, we will not bow to compromise. And God, we will never fail to bow to you as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We put our faith in you. We put our hope in you and our trust in you. In Jesus' mighty and precious name, I pray. And everybody said, amen. Come on, Movement Church. Let's give a hand clap. What a message and what a moment. God is on the move and I'm believing that he met you right where you are today. If you just prayed that prayer, please let us know. We want to get a Bible in your hands and make sure that you know you don't have to do life alone. Follow the prompts on the screen so we can help you get connected to your next steps. 
if you call the Movement Church home, I want to remind you to continue to be faithful with returning the tithe and bringing the offering. You can give online right now by following the prompts on the screen. And for those of you who are local to Orange County, California, we'd love to see you in person on a Sunday at 10 a.m. at Laguna Hills High School. For those that are far away but are looking for an in-person church, email us at info at the ocmovement.com and we will do our best to help you in your search. It's been an honor to have you online with us today. We'll see you next week, Movement Church.